Today, we're going to kind of kick off a two-part series, um, start it today and wrap up next week. This series is called Hostage, and uh, we're going to look at a couple of hostage situations in the Bible, probably some hostage situations that you never really thought were hostage situations, okay? And uh, so today, we're going to kind of camp out in the book of Jonah. Um, it's kind of in the Old Testament, um, kind of in the, those minor prophet sections. So I want to give you a little bit of time to, to turn there. And while you're doing that, can I share with you a personal story, all right? This is a personal story. Um, this is no embellishment whatsoever. I'm bringing you the facts. When Aaron and I first got married, uh, we lived in this little pier and beam house um, in Sulphur Springs, Texas. And uh, we loved this little home. And uh, one particular night in our first year of marriage, about midnight, we heard this terrible, awful scratching sound at our window. Now, just kind of give you the, the lay of the, of the bedroom. There was the bed. And then just to my side of the bed, there was a window. And we heard this awful scratching sound. It was almost like someone was trying to break into our house. We both woke up immediately and Aaron said, did you hear that? And I said, yes, I think someone's trying to break into our house. To which she said, go see what it is. <laughs> I was like, I don't think this is a go see what it is situation. I think this is a let's hide in the closet situation. I think this is let's call 911 situation. This is not Andy, get up and go see what it is. But we were newlyweds, and here was my bride kind of trusting in her Superman to solve the problem. So I did what Superman would do. I went to the kitchen, got the biggest knife that I could find, and uh, grabbed my flashlight and headed out the back door. And the reason I went out the back door is because I knew that there was a fence between the backyard and the front yard, and the window was in the front yard. And so if this person, uh, when I shined the light on him and, and hollered, um, if he came running after me, I could kind of get back into the house. He would at least have to jump the fence, and um, I could go inside and, and call the police. So I've got my knife. Um, I've got my flashlight. I kind of creep over to the side of the house, and I kind of mustered up the courage, and I whipped around the corner, and I said, hey! And guess what I saw? Absolutely nothing. There was nothing there. At the, I'm shining the light around. I'm looking around. I'm like, well, I must have scared him off. And so I went back in. I said, hey, baby, I took care of it. Superman is here for you. And uh, we started to doze off back to sleep. And right about that time, we're falling asleep. No embellishments here in this story. Right about the time we're falling asleep, guess what we heard? The scratching, awful sound right at our window. And we both popped up, and she said, did you hear that? I said, yeah. And she said, go see what it is. And I said, all right. So I went and grabbed that knife again, grabbed the flashlight. And this time I thought, all right, I'm heading out the front door. Because when I came around the back, the person must have heard me, and they must have ran around the front and hid or, or behind the tree or something like that. And so I'm going to go around the front and catch them. You know, I've got the fence at the back. There's no way they could, they could escape. And so I go around the front side of the house, and I mustered up the courage right around that corner. And I went, hey! And guess what I saw? Absolutely Nothing. So I went back inside. I said, hey, baby, I took care of it this time, I promise. Right about the time we were dozing off to sleep, guess what we heard? This terrible, awful scratching sound right at our window. There's no way that we, it was terrifying. But this time, I'm not scared. I'm mad. And this thing is keeping us up at night. Uh, we need some beauty sleep. And so I go grab that knife and I grab that flashlight. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to hush around the corner. I just march right around that corner, right up to the window. And I'm flashing the light. I'm thinking, what in the world is going on? And right below, this is the Pier and Beam house, right below that uh, window, there was a vent, a little access uh, to, to crawl space underneath the house. And I shine the light in this hideous claw came reaching out of the vent and pulled itself back in and I screamed like a girl. I threw the knife and I ran back inside and I said, Aaron, there is a bear underneath our house. I just saw a bear cloud. That's what, it's either that or a lion. I don't know, but something horrific is underneath our house. And guess what she said? Well, go get it out. And she really thinks a uh, uh, a lot of me, right? And so I'm like, all right. So I went to the shed. I got a shovel, and um, I went to that vent, and kind of from a distance, I, I I pried open this vent and got it open. And I went and I stood back and I just kind of waited. And then I heard something and I shined the light. And guess what came running out of our house? A skunk. 
exactly. A big old skunk came running out, and he ran right under the neighbor's house, and I was like, fine, we'll deal with that tomorrow. And I went, and I boarded up that vent, and we went back in, started to fall asleep, and guess what we heard? Yes, that scratching sound all over again. I am furious. What the world is going on? So I, I go back in. I can't figure out what's going on. So I open up that vent, and I stand back again, and I hear something. So I shine a light, and guess what I see? Three baby skunks come running out of our house, following Mama over, over here. Um, evidently, Mom was uh, growing a little... Uh, um, um, skunk family, you know, underneath, underneath our house. So I boarded it up, went back to, to bed, and finally got some rest that night. Now, we thought something or someone was trying to get in to our house. And what we didn't realize was there was something trying to get out from under our house. See, we were unknowingly holding a family of skunks hostage in our house. That's what it means to hold something hostage, right? To hold something hostage means that you're not uh, going to let go of it. You're not going to release it. Now, we were doing this unknowingly. And the question that I, that I have for you today, I didn't just tell you that, that, skunk, reason, that skunk story for no reason, uh, all kind of to point to this question. The question I have for you today and also next week is this. Are you unknowingly holding something hostage? Are you unknowingly holding something hostage? I'm not talking about skunks underneath your house. I'm not talking about, you know, some valued possession in the trunk of your car. I'm not talking about, you know, you're walking into a bank and you're holding the teller hostage for money. But I'm talking about in our relationship with God, is there something in our life that we are unknowingly holding hostage? And what I mean is, is there something that God is asking of us, but yet we're unwilling to release it into his custody? Is there a part of us? Is there a piece of us? Is there something in our life that God wants? And he wants us to give him total control. He wants us to release it fully under his authority and under his control. Is there something that God wants, but we are holding it hostage? And we, and we kind of do this. We say, okay, God, I'll do this if, if you do this. I'll let go of this one thing if you promise to do this. Yeah, God, I'll, I'd be happy to follow you in this area, but first, you've got to do this. You know what we find ourselves doing? We find ourselves negotiating with God. Negotiating with God. We find ourselves actually bargaining with God, and we're holding something ransom in our life. We're going to talk about two things that I think a lot of us struggle with holding Hostage. We're going to talk about one today and one next week. Um, and we're going to look at a hostage situation in the book of Jonah. Now, you might be thinking this. All right, hostage situation in Jonah. God must be holding Jonah hostage in the belly of a giant fish. All right, look, that's not what this is about. This is not a hostage story on God's end. This is a hostage story on Jonah's end. There is something that Jonah is holding hostage from God. Now, I've never been in a hostage situation I've never uh, held um, anything, you know, like a child or, or, or stuff or a bank up for hostage. But according to what we find on TV, right, when you've got someone who's holding something hostage, they always want something, right? Turn to your neighbor and say, that makes sense. That makes sense, right? The hostage person always wants something. You don't just go hold something or someone hostage for fun, right? There's always something you want, and so you hold something hostage in order to have leverage to get what you want. So if Jonah is holding something hostage, that must mean that there is something Jonah wants. So as we kind of read this story, we're going to kind of push the ball uphill to try to answer this question, what is it that Jonah wants? Turn to your neighbor right now, and because we're going to come back to this question, ask him this question, what is it that Jonah wants? Wants. Go ahead. Ask your neighbor that question. There we go. All right. Thank you. What is it that Jonah wants? All right. Start reading with me. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. 
the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because their evil has come up before me. Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. Now, a couple things I want to point out here. Number one, I want you to see the progression here. Here's the progression. God speaks, Jonah hears, Jonah responds. Make sense? Easy enough. God speaks. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to Nineveh and preach against it because that city's evil and their evilness has come up you know, to me. I'm going to do something about it. Jonah hears. Jonah's not missing the message. Okay, Jonah hears and Jonah responds. That's always the progression when it comes to our relationship with God. God speaks. Guess what? We hear. And when we hear God speak, guess what? It demands a response. There's always a response to when God speaks. Always. We don't ever get to say, okay, God, well, I'm not really going to respond to that thing. No, no, no. We do respond one way or the other. We either respond in faith, I believe you, God, I trust you, God, and the outcome is obedience, or we respond in unbelief. I don't believe you, God. I don't trust you. And so we respond in disobedience. But when God speaks and we hear, guess what? It always leads to a response. God speaks to uh, to Jonah. Jonah hears and Jonah responds. What's his response? It says that he got up to flee to Tarshish. Let me ask you this question. What was Jonah running from? What was Jonah running from? Now, I used to think, I'll be honest with you, I used to think Jonah was running from Nineveh. Because after all, Tarshish is this way, right? And Nineveh is this way. God speaks to Jonah. He has to respond. I either obey God and trust him and go to where he says go, or I disobey God and I don't trust him and I go the opposite direction. I used to think Jonah was running away from Nineveh. But did you notice what the scripture says? He's not running from Nineveh. And I used to think that Jonah was running from the people of Nineveh because God said they were evil. I mean, can you imagine Jonah? Hey, uh, hey, Jonah, I want you to go to this evil city and preach a message against them. Like, who signs up for that, right? No, like, no, I don't want to do that. They might kill me. They're evil. They're corrupt. I don't want to go to these people. What are they going to do to me? So I used to think, all right, Jonah was running from Nineveh or Jonah was running from the people of Nineveh. Listen, that's not what Jonah's running from. What does the Bible say? It says Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish. Here it is. From the Lord's presence. Wow. He's not running from Nineveh, is he? Who's he running from? He's running from God. You ever had your mom tell you to do something as a kid? (laughs) Go, go make your bed, right? And you don't do it. I don't know about you, but I used to find ways not to be around mom <laughs> because she would ask me, hey, Andy, did you make your bed? And so you know that when you're walking in disobedience, you, you try to socially distance yourself from the people that ask you to do that, right? Jonah is, is socially distancing from God, physically distancing from God, spiritually distancing himself from God. And just to make sure that this is not just some sort of phrase in the Bible, look, it's mentioned again. In the last sentence of verse 3, he paid the fare, went down into the boat to go with them to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. I want you to see this. Jonah is running from God. And he is running from the presence of God. Why? Because there is something Jonah wants. And what Jonah wants is not congruent with what God wants. And so what does Jonah do? Jonah holds obedience hostage. God, I'm not going to obey you. I'm going to hold my disobedience hostage because there is something else that I want that doesn't line up with what you want. So what is it that Jonah wants? That's the question we're trying to answer, right? What does Jonah want? Well, 
Um, we're going to kind of get to that in, in chapter 4, but let me kind of fill in the gaps a little bit. In verse 4, I love this. I don't think this is on the screen for you, but it says, But the Lord threw a great wind onto the sea. I love that phrasing. The Lord threw a great wind. Can I tell you something? Sometimes God allows things to happen. Sometimes God causes things to happen, and sometimes God like just throws things, you know, down to happen, right? I mean, it's, it's happening. And that's what we see here. God's not just allowing the storm or causing the storm. I mean, he is downright throwing the storm. Now, you have all these sailors. who They're not novice, all right? They're not beginning sailors. They're experts in their field, and they're scared. They're terrified for their life. They start throwing stuff overboard. Let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. Someone goes down to the bottom of the boat. They're bringing up cargo, and they run into Jonah. And what do they ask Jonah? They said, hey, Jonah, you need to pray to your God, and we got to figure out what's going on here. Now, what's Jonah thinking? I don't want to pray to my God. <laughs> I'm running from God. Don't ask me to talk to him. Like, I'm, I'm trying to flee his presence. I'm running the, in, in the opposite direction. In verse 10, um, Jonah tells them that, that he's running from God because it says in verse 10, the men were seized by great fear and they said to him, what is this you've done? The men knew he was fleeing from the Lord's presence because he told them so. Jonah, you're, you're running from, from God? And, and by the way, Jonah says, my God, he's not like your gods. My big G God, he's not like your little G gods because my God created the winds and the waves and the storms. And they're like, whoa, so what are we going to do with you? And Jonah says, throw me overboard. And they're like, okay, but God, don't hold us accountable for his life. Don't, don't hold his blood against us. They take Jonah, they throw him overboard, and we all know the story. God sends a giant fish, right, that has a little snack lunch on Jonah. And uh, Jonah finds himself in the belly of this giant fish, probably a whale, for three days and three nights. If you're running from God, that's a lot of time to think, right? That's a lot of time to reevaluate this relationship with God and start to make some decisions to reorient your life to what God is asking you to do. That's exactly what we see happen, right? The fish goes and vomits up Jonah. He finds himself on dry land. And what happens next? Jonah goes into Nineveh, chapter 3, verse 4. It says, Jonah set out on the first day of his walk in the city and proclaimed, In 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished. That is the world's shortest sermon right there. One sentence, seven words. You might be thinking, all right, Andy, come on, wrap it up. You know, you're talking a whole lot more than Jonah did. One sentence. The city, uh, in 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished. Let's go back to our progression that we talked about at the beginning. What happens when God speaks? We hear. We have to respond, right? So there's a response now to what God has said. So how do the people of Nineveh respond? Well, they actually respond appropriately. They listen to the word of God. They trust what God is saying. And so they turn from their evil they put on sackcloth, they mourn for their wickedness, they cry over their sin, they fast, and they reorient their lives to the Lord. And so what does God do? God relents, God saves, God does not bring about his judgment, he does not bring about his punishment, and so what is Jonah's response? I mean, he preaches a message, one sentence, the whole town gets saved. You would think Jonah would be all excited about that. What does he do? Chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. He prayed to the Lord, Please, Lord, isn't this what I thought while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled toward Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and one who returns or who relents from sending disaster. So, why did, uh, what is it that Jonah wanted? That's the question we're asking, right? What is it that Jonah wanted? You know what Jonah wanted? Jonah wanted Nineveh to pay. They've done evil. They've wronged people, and they have wronged God. 
They have been disobedient. They have mocked God. They have laughed in God's face. They are a corrupt people. You can't trust them. They deserve to be punished by God. That's what Jonah wanted. And so what did he do? He held obedience hostage. God, I'm not going to obey because I want to get my way. You know what that's called? That's actually called pride. Can I give you a a definition of pride? If you're taking notes, you might want to jot this one down. Pride is when we say, my way is better than your way. That's pride. And it may not just be saying it out loud, but it's saying it through our actions. And guess what? Our actions speak a whole lot louder than our words. And this is what pride is. Pride is when we say, my way is better than your way. And that's what Jonah is struggling with. He's not just struggling with disobedience. He's struggling with pride. And it's his pride that is leading to disobedience. He's saying, God, you're, no, 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 that's not fair. God, they deserve to die. They deserve to be punished. And I know you, God. I know your character. I know your nature. You are compassionate. And you are gracious and you are faithful and you love turning away from your anger and pouring out mercy on people. But God, that's not what I want. These people deserve to pay. So I'm going to go the opposite direction and I'm going to hold my obedience hostage because I'm not getting my way. Listen, every act of disobedience, every act of disobedience begins with some form of pride. Let's go back to the very beginning. Adam and Eve, right? What does she do? Eve looks at this fruit, and it says that she looked on it with her eyes, and she saw that it was good. She began to crave it. She began to want it. She began to think, God must be withholding something good from us. And then she saw that it, was, it had the ability to make her wise and to make her like God. And so for a split moment, she believed, my way is better than God's way. So I'm going to eat the fruit. Because God's withholding something from me. And so she walked out in disobedience. She held obedience hostage in order to get her way. Can we fast forward to another story real quick? Um, King Saul. This is in 1 Samuel, I think, 13. Um, Saul is spoken to by God. God speaks through the servant uh, Samuel, the prophet. And Samuel tells King Saul, um, God wants to pour out his wrath on the Amalekites, and so you got to wipe out everything, right? you got to wipe out everything. And in the Bible, the word everything um, means everything. And, and Samuel was specific, all the animals, like the goats and the cows and the sheep and you know, all the things that go nay, um, it's got to go. And so uh, they go to war against the Amalekites, they win. Um, Saul gets the idea with the people that they're going to keep back some of the best of the best of the best. Samuel shows up and is like, hey, Saul, did you obey God? What does Saul say? Sure did. Yes, sir, I obeyed the Lord. And Samuel goes, good, wait, wait, just a second, what's... What's that I hear? I hear some cows mooing and some sheep. Uh, what do sheep do? Sheep buying. I hear some goats neighing. There's a lot of noise out there. What, what are these animals, King Saul? And what does King Saul say? Oh, that. Don't worry about that. That's, that's worship next Saturday. <laughs> we're, we're, gonna take, we're taking the best, and we're going to have a big worship service to God. It's going to be awesome. And Samuel says, no, you missed it. To obey is better than sacrifice. You know what God desires more than our worship? He desires a life of obedience to him. When he speaks, we hear a life that responds and doesn't say, I'm going to hold obedience hostage so I can get my way. What God desires is that we hand over freely our obedience and we say, God, your way is better than my way. Saul struggled with that. You know why? Because Saul struggled with pride. And Saul believed, my way of doing this is better than God's way. So, look, it's easy for us to look at Jonah, kind of critique him and 
pick out where he got wrong and look at King Saul and see where he got it wrong and look at Eve and see where he got it wrong. But most importantly, what is it in our lives where God has spoken and we've clearly heard him, but we have not responded in obedience? And the reason we have not responded in obedience is because we believe our way is better than God's way. I want to close just by reading a couple of verses of Scripture. Now, here's the thing. When you confront pride, pride doesn't like it. (laughs) You don't confront pride and pride go, oh, okay, sure, let me humble myself. No, no, no. Pride and humility are are opposite, all right? Humility accepts and and receives and, and responds in obedience, pride rejects and pushes away. I, I'm going to read a couple of verses of Scripture. And I want to do this because I, I don't want this to be Andy telling you or, or Andy speaking to your ears. I want, I want just for a few moments just to allow God to speak to our heart. Because what a great opportunity to surrender ourselves to the Lord, to walk in obedience, to humble ourselves. What a great opportunity right here at the beginning of a new year. To kind of put pride in our past and say, God, I, this is going to be hard. Because there's everything within me than my pride that, that wants to cry out, but God, my way's better. But what a, what a fantastic time of year to come face to face with the word of God and say, okay, God, what, what is it? Now, for me, the list is long, okay, of issues that God's working on. But, what, but what's the one thing, all right? So let me just kind of read a couple of verses. And, and my prayer for this is that God would just, just speak to your heart, all right? As I speak to ears, I just pray that God would speak to your heart and he might reveal something to you, an action step that you need to take in obedience, all right? You with me? All right. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14. Scripture says, flee from idolatry. Flee means run, Run from idolatry. I wonder how many of us, um, whether you're watching online or you're here in the service, would say, you know what, I've been flirting with idolatry. Because I, you know, my way's better than, than God's way. God says flee. I think it's okay just to kind of flirt with idolatry. As long as it doesn't get a complete hold on me, there's a little bit there, it's okay. No, no, the Bible says flee from idolatry. Or what about this one? Also in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is a, is a tough book if you want to read it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, flee from sexual immorality. There's a lot of people in our world with, that would say today, no, no, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do that. No, who's God to tell me what to do? It's not like he made me or anything. It's not like he knows what's best. <laughs> I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm not hurting anybody. The Bible says, flee, run from sexual immorality. Pride says, oh, my way's better. Here's another one, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16. Don't neglect to do what is good and to share. Now, we think that talking about sharing is a kid's lesson, right? It's an adult lesson too, isn't it? Don't neglect to do what is good and to share, for God is pleased with such sacrifices. You know what God calls us to share? No, 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 God, but my way's better. I want to own my stuff. I want it to belong to me and me only. In fact, I want to put my name on it and say, keep out. Stay away. Don't touch. It's my house. It's my truck. It's my stuff. It's my kids. It's my spouse. It's my job. These are my talents. This is my money. This is my time. We go on and on with things that we want to put a tight grip on and call it mine. And God says, no, 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 no. Do good and share. 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 Now, here's one in James chapter 5, verse 16. This one's tough. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. God, are you serious? You want us to confess our sins to one another? Are you kidding me? My way's better than God's way. I'll just keep it in because I've got this. I can overcome the addiction. I can overcome the thing that's in the closet. I don't need to obey God. What does God know? (laughs) I'll do it my way. What's he say? Confess your sins one to another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. 
Now, I'm not saying that you've got to get in front of everybody and, you know, just blast out there publicly everything you've ever done. But you know what? There, do, there does need to be people in our lives that we can be open and honest with and say, you know what? This is a sin that I'm struggling with. God says that you don't find condemnation in that when you do it with a fellow brother or sister in Christ. God says you find healing in that. There is healing that comes when what is in the dark comes out into the light. And there's a lot of us that would wrestle with this and say, "Uh uh-uh, not me, because pride does not want to come face to face with this. Pride wants to say, my way's better. I'll just keep it to myself. It's a new year. I'll try harder. Just willpower will get me through. Really? Really? Has it gotten you through the last decade? What makes you think 2021 is going to be any different? What would it look like if we humbled ourselves and we were actually obedient to what God was asking us to do in his word? Is that the last one? All right, that's the last one. So here's the question. Are you unknowingly holding something hostage? Are you unknowingly holding something hostage? Look, there's a progression. It's simple. God's word's not complicated. We make it complicated. God speaks, we hear, and we respond. So my question to you to this today is what is your response? I'm going to invite you to bow your heads and and close your eyes. In a a weird kind of way, (laughs) I want you to think back to the story I opened up with, with skunks that we were holding hostage underneath our house. Listen, the longer we hold something hostage the smellier it gets, the stinkier it gets. Today, maybe there's something that you're carrying, there's something that God has has shed light on in your life that you've been holding hostage. There's an area of obedience that you have held tightly and you have not let go of and given that completely to God because there's something you want. There's something that you desire, that you believe your way is, is actually better than God's way. My, my encouragement, my plead with you today would be this, just to surrender and submit and humble yourself before God Almighty who made you, who knows every thought that you have, knows every desire, and he desires what is best for you and for I. And so God, we come and we ask that you would speak to our hearts. It may not be anything that, any of the scriptures that I've read today, but there may be a, a passage of scripture that, that we've read this past week and, and, it, and it's hit, hit us hard, it's hit us right between the eyes and, and we've kind of pushed back and said, God, not, not today, not right now. God, would you give us the, the energy? Would you give us the strength? Would you give us the grace to humble ourselves before you, God, and to walk in your ways? Not so that we can get a pat on the back or not so that we can even earn our way into heaven. But God, so that we can be a living testimony to the world around us. A world that is walking so contrary to your ways. A world that honestly is lost. And trying to find their way forward. God, a world that that rejects you. May we not be like Jonah. And say, may the world get what the world deserves. But God, may we be a people, a conduit of your love and your grace to the people that you place in our lives. God, bring glory to your name through us, your people, your church. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.